us, Father, and that uh, uh, we're grateful, Father, for you giving us this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Um, sorry about the delay. Um, so, um, uh, good evening. My name is Eddie Ramos, and today we're going to be continuing uh, talking about uh, the book uh, Mr. by Mr. Harold Camping, 1994. Uh, we're gonna we're actually in chapter eleven now, and uh, that's where we're gonna be picking up. So chapter eleven essentially is the second half of chapter ten, where Mr. Camping uh, uh, made up a mythical character, a Jew uh, named Nathaniel, living uh, a few decades before uh, the birth of Christ, and he wanted to basically show that you know if if a, if a person uh, will, would really look through the Bible, would they find any information um, relating to the coming of Christ? And so that's basically what he set out to do. Uh, so Nathaniel essentially, uh, like I said, he is a Jew, uh, and he only had the Old Testament available to him. And he wanted to know if God's word provided a year not only for his birth, but also for the, the, the death, uh, a date for the death of Christ, a year for it. Uh, and Nathaniel's premise and even looking for these dates in the Bible was because I believe the book of Daniel chapter nine uh, gave him parts of a timeline concerning these specific events. And because Nathaniel knew that the Bible already provided a lot of key dates uh, and important event, to important events like the flood, uh, along with many more timelines, he set out to see if he could get enough information from the Bible, because that really was the only, or the Old Testament, because that was really was only available to him. So this is what kind of Mr. Camping set out forth to display, that if someone only had the Old Testament uh, during the period of the Old Testament, uh, or the latter period of the Old Testament, would they be able to have enough information to conclude uh, for sure uh, if God would provide that information. And of course, all the ultimate uh, purpose of the book is to talk about later, uh, well, if God did it in the Old Testament, uh, what about uh, at the end of the world? Would God give us that information? Um, and so uh, this chapter 11, Nathaniel's trying to put all the information uh, that he gathered together from chapter 10. Um, and while both chapters, at least for me, were difficult to uh, follow completely uh, as far as it you know for it to be clear um, I got to the when I got to the end uh, of this chapter um, I think that's really when it began to make more sense to me uh, it was a lot easier for me to be like work my way back and say oh wow I, I kind of see now where he was going with all this and when I got to the end it, it kind of uh, came together for me uh, so I think for me one of the most uh, interesting things that I was looking at that stood out was the errors. Um, when Mr. Camping pointed out the errors that God allowed uh, in the development of the secular calendar. Uh, on the last paragraph of page 373, Mr. Camping explains these errors. And one of them uh, being the transition uh, of the calendars from BC, which stands for before Christ, to AD. Um, and these transitions uh, in the secular calendar were supposed to be based on the birth of Christ. Okay, that's what they were following. And uh, what's interesting is that the, the transition um, or was when they set zero, when they set uh, BC to AD, uh, they were seven years off. Okay, uh, so in other words, Christ was born seven years before uh, the calendar. Uh, transition. So the transition was incorrect, in other words. And God uses this error. Um, as I was reading the chapter, God uses this error, which focused on Christ, to point out biblical truths uh, that help us see that God's hand was in all this, the, uh, this whole time. Okay. And so on page 375, uh, Mr. Camping shows us how historical biblical accounts uh, uh, relate to the mistake that God allowed these uh the secular he allowed to be made in the secular calendar um so in other words the transition of the calendar from from bc to ad like i said was seven years off uh, this means that instead of the life of christ starting uh on the ad side of the calendar um it actually started seven years earlier okay 
uh, because and then we also know that Christ was crucified on 33 AD. So here we have two two numbers. Uh, we have seven BC that we're always talking about, and then we have 33 AD, seven and 33, and those are the two numbers. Uh, again, we we use these numbers because of the error in the secular calendar, and this is these are the numbers that Mr. Camping. Uh, he actually use he actually shows us in the Bible how those calend those mistakes actually um, line up with a lot of uh, evidence in the scriptures. Uh, so I want to read a couple paragraphs from page three seventy four. Um, at the bottom of the par at the last paragraph at the bottom it says, uh, "Let us look for a moment at error number one, that Jesus was born in the year zero instead of the year seven B.C." Uh, we, we have learned that David was a great type of Christ, and he ruled over Israel for 40 years. There was a division in his ruling. The Bible informs us that he ruled seven years in Hebron over a part of Israel. At the beginning of the seven years, many people of Israel were still aligned to the house of Saul. So the previous, who was the previous king? During these seven years, David consolidated his rule. Uh, in the eighth year, he was able to reign and rule over all Israel from the holy city, Jerusalem. He thus reigned for seven years from Hebron over part of Israel and for 33 years from Jerusalem over all of Israel. And then I made a little side note here of the number seven and the number 33. Seven AD, 33, or seven BC, 33 uh, AD. And he continues, this dramatic picture of the reign of Christ before the cross, uh, Christ ruled over a relative, relatively small number of believers. After the cross, Christ's rule extended to believers in every nation of the world. Thus, the period beginning from 7 BC represents the Old Testament side of the cross. The period that ends with 33 AD represent, represents the rule of Christ on the New Testament side of the cross. Only because of the error that is built into our calendar do we see this significant relationship. And then he goes on to explain one more example. Uh, it says, we see a similar relationship in connection with the circumcision of a Jewish baby. The baby was unclean for a period of 40 days. This 40-day period was divided into two periods, one seven days long and the other 33 days. This was because on the eighth day, the baby was circumcised. Okay, this circumcision pointed to the circumcision, the cutting off, the shedding of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thus, it uh, in the way that God guided and allowed our calendar to be developed, he emphasized this distinction between the Old Testament side of the cross and the New Testament side. And then he goes on to, to kind of break that down a little bit more. But I think to me, that was a, a, a really significant point that he made and it really stood out for me. Um, so I'll go ahead and open up the floor to anyone else. Um, okay. Um, yeah. I was going to talk about that a little bit too, about um, uh, on page 370, where Nathaniel, you know, after all of this is a study of the Old Testament, was ready to make some conclusions. And he concluded that Messiah would be born in 7 BC, the Jubilee year, in Bethlehem, based on, um, you know, uh, the timelines, and also Micah 5, verse 2, uh, which prophesied about that. And then he also concluded that in, in 33 AD, that Messiah would be 39, um, based on if he was born in, in 7 BC. And this was, this was the age that Joseph was when he saved Jacob and his brothers from starvation. And so... Uh, Nathaniel, the mythical Jew, thought that this could could this be the year that God would pour out his wrath on the Messiah because he was laden with our sins. And uh, as, as we had discussed before many times in this panel discussion, uh, Mr. Camping, uh, uh, you know, after about 17 years after he wrote this book, uh, which was a few years before 2011, he began to teach that Christ bore the sins of the elect at the foundation of the world in eternity past, and that he suffered God's wrath then, and, and when he suffered God's wrath again on the cross, 
he wasn't paying for sins. So, you know, what Mr. Camping was saying in the book 1994, he had later corrected uh, that, that Jesus was um, not merely, but it was, he was suffering the wrath of God in demonstrating what he had done at the foundation of the world. Um, and as far as uh, what to do with, with uh, 34 AD, you know, that, that, that was 33 AD uh, that I just mentioned, but 34 AD came up a lot in Nathaniel's studies, I think nine times. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, time paths that led to 34 AD. Uh, and, but later on, a few pages later on page three, 373, Mr. Camping ruled out 34 AD as Mr. Camping. Uh, he stepped into his own book and, and because he said, we know from the New Testament that we have now that Nathaniel didn't have, that Jesus was crucified in 33 AD on the Passover and that 40 years later, he, he ascended into heaven. So Nathaniel, who theoretically lived before Christ's first coming, could not have possibly known, as we know, that live, we that live after Christ's first coming, that uh, to go from an Old Testament date to a New Testament date, he would have had to subtract a year because there is no year zero in the calendar. And, you know, for example, Mr. Camping used uh, this example to find out the number of years that would pass from, say, 15 BC to 10 AD, you would have to add 15 to 10, which would be 25, and then subtract one because there's no year zero. You would then see that 24 years had passed instead of 25. Mm -hmm. And the impact of this truth, which God allowed uh, people not to see, uh, it allowed for two methods of, uh, to calculate the passage of time from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Um, there, there's actual years arrived at, like I said, by, by subtracting one from the sum of the Old Testament uh, date to the New Testament date. And then there are calendar years arrived at by uh, simply adding the Old Testament date to the New Testament date and leaving it alone. Um, I, was, I wanted to read um, on page 376 in the box, uh, Mr. Camping said the actual years versus the calendar years provide the solution to the puzzle of both 33 AD and 34 AD, appearing to be significant concerning the coming of the Messiah. And then um, on page uh, 377, using, using that information, he goes through and gives and, and shows that there's 11 time paths that land on 33 AD and, and none that land on 34 AD when you use, when you take into consideration the actual years and the calendar years. Um, so uh, if you're interested in um, all of those time paths, they're on page 377. I was gonna read them, but it'd probably take too long. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to, uh, let me see, uh, Robert. Yeah, so the Bible is an incredible book, you know, written by God. And it's just amazing how a true believer on the Old Testament side of the cross could, if by God, open up his spiritual eyes, they could know the date of the coming Messiah. But for instance, like on page 359, Mr. Camping writes about the 11 day journey in this particular chapter. And, the, and uh, it reads there in the bottom of page 359, Nathaniel became interested in a strange verse in Deuteronomy. The verse, uh, the verse was Deuteronomy chapter one, verse two. It reads 11, that 11 day journey journey from uh, Horeb to Kadesh Barnea 
And Mr. Camping is wondering, could this 11 day period goes back from creation until the coming Messiah? And it's a pretty interesting uh, way how he, 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 lay, he lays it out. That if you turn over to page 360 at the bottom there, at the bottom paragraph of Mr. Camping writes about it, you're at the very bottom of page 360. What about the 11 days? Nathaniel realized uh, that Psalm 90 verse, uh, verse four said, a thousand years in thy sight are as, but as yesterday. Could 11 days represent 11,000 years? Was God teaching in this verse that there are 11,000 years from creation to the coming Messiah? And uh, it's, you know, I never really, paid attention to that until Mr. Kev. I read through the book before and I'm so grateful that we're reading through this book again to see that, yeah, there's this pointing to that time. And uh, how Mr. Camping lays it out in the Bible, and I mean, in, in the 1994 book, excuse me, how he lays it out and show that time pass. And in that book, in the, in, in the little block there, he says the passage 11,000 years from creation came to 13 BC was uh, 13 BC was 13 BC a date to be to be remembered and he went on to in the next few paragraphs there and he goes on to uh, if you turn over to um up to page 362 how he continues to lay out that timeline from creation onward and he goes on here in this in the middle of page 362 where Mr. Camping writes, Nathaniel began to search more for more information concerning a, a time span of 23 years or concerning the number of 23. He found one outstanding place where 23 years was the end of an era. And he goes on to lay it out there like yeah, he continued to read the end of the nation of Israel when they were destroyed by the Babylonians in 609 BC and how he carefully lays out that information. I find this uh, chapter pretty interesting how a true believer on the Old Testament side of the cross could have known and seen by God's mercy this timeline, how God lays it out in, in, in the Bible. And we thank God that God opened Mr. Camping eyes to, to, to these things in the Bible and how they're at the bottom of page 362 where Mr. Camping writes, and how he, he speaks a lot about Daniel 8 in this, in, in, in this book. He says, Daniel 8, he says, in Daniel 8, at the bottom of the, of the page, it says, in Daniel 8, 23, 25, Nathaniel discovered who this little horn was, where God taught. In, and he, and he, he, he writes the, quotes the verse from the Bible. And it was interesting to me how on the next page of 363, how Mr. Camping lays out the little horn and what the little horn is. And uh, in, a, in, a, in the chapter there, right in the middle of page 363, where Mr. Camping writes, God would in some sense allow the congregation to be destroyed by, by this little horn. Thus, Nathaniel saw that history was to repeat itself. Israel was subjugated and destroyed by that by the by Babylonians when the time ended for it to be an independent nation of God's people at, and at the end time God's people will be destroyed by a king of fierce countenance and and how we see how history repeats itself when you when you compare it to the the New Testament church and then you turn on the next page to uh, 365 at the bottom and he, he he continues there more about the number 11 how he lays it out and says while nathaniel continued to pray for wisdom concerning the number of relationship as they related to the possible timing of the coming messiah he noted another special emphasis on the number 11. god at times revealed the death ages of some of his patriarchs and he theory he speaks about Abraham and, and so forth and and how is it he, he he laid out a very interesting thing there that I really didn't pay attention to where 
Joseph and Joshua, that he, he got how God lists their death age twice. They both lived to be 110 years old. And how he, he lays all that information out. And now he speaks about Joseph. We know that Joseph, there's a type of Christ and, and so forth. And, and, I, and you know, I never really paid attention to this. A lot of things I didn't pay attention to was as I read the book before, but it really didn't stick. Hmm. On page 366, where Brother Camping write, writes about Joseph, how he's a great type of Christ. Here in the middle, he says, the first man was Joseph. Nathaniel discovered that in many ways, Joseph appeared to be a figure or type of the coming Messiah. He was the one who saved Israel when they would have died of starvation. He was the one who had come out of prison to become the prime minister of Egypt. Second, only to Pharaoh, the highest ruler of the land. So too, Nathaniel knew that the coming Messiah would endure the wrath of God, the eternal prison of hell. I think if I'm understanding this correctly, that Ms. Camping is tied the time that Joseph spent in prison was a type of figure of Christ in hell for the, for the, uh, the believer's sin and he he, he was released from prison and Christ rose from the from the from hell so to speak to to be the Messiah and he, he's going to deliver us also on that last day uh, and also over on page uh, let me see I think it's page 372 of Mr. Camping's book 1994. And how Mr. Camping writes about the uh, Nathaniel's conclusion is very accurate. So, it if God uh, opened the eyes of an Old Testament believer by His mercy, that person studying the Bible very diligently by God's mercy could have known when the Messiah would be born. And one last uh, point there in page three seventy two. It says, to facilitate this study, we have attempted to walk in the shoes of a mythical Jew named Daniel, who lived a few decades before the first coming of Christ. He, would, he was a serious and diligent student of the Bible, our Old Testament. He discovered conclusively that the Messiah would be born in the year 7 BC from our vantage point, hmm of having the New Testament as well as Old Testament, we know that this conclusion was totally accurate and so on. I think it was, uh, it's pretty interesting how God lays down an open brother camping eyes to this time path uh, leading to the first coming of the Messiah. Oh, move on to someone else. Okay, thanks, Robert. Um, so, yeah, in these two chapters, uh, as Eddie noted, they're really two chapters, the timing of Christ, for Christ's first coming, that are really kind of, um, it's almost like one long chapter that was split in two. Where, really, what I feel like with this is um, we're seeing Mr. Camping's mindset as he looked at end time dates. You kind of get like a little bit of a glimpse into his thoughts on this, like how he looked at different years and said, okay, maybe it's this year. And then this year kept coming up. I, I feel like that's kind of what he's doing. It's almost like a behind the scenes look at um, how he came to some of the conclusions as God was guiding him in looking at years like 1994, 1988, and 2011. Um, a couple of things that I had sort of forgotten about, like um, Robert was mentioning the Joseph and Joshua with the, how um, they both lived to be 110 years old and how that the number 11 was in there and how that was pointing to the coming of Christ. I had forgotten that we, we, we learned that there's two times for both cases. So Joshua is told, we're told in two different verses that he died at 110 and Joseph were told in two different places that he died at 110 and how it was pointing and how that verse in Genesis 41 about when something is doubled, mm -hmm. uh, it's established by God and and God will surely bring it or shortly bring it to pass. Um, 
uh, Robert also touched on the king of the of fierce countenance. I thought this was an interesting section here on page 363. I just want to read it because he tied in. Uh, it was kind of touched on by Robert, but I just want to um, read the verse uh, Deuteronomy 28 verses 49 and 50. This is where it mentions a nation of fierce countenance. Uh, in Deuteronomy 28, verse 49, it says, Jehovah shall bring a nation against thee, speaking to Israel, from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of old, nor show favor to the young. And this nation here is pointing to the Babylonians, who would destroy national Israel. And then he ties this, Mr. Camping ties this in with the destruction of the, of the local congregations. Daniel 8, verse 23, I'll read verses 23 and 24. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up and his power shall be mighty, but not by <clears throat> his own power, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And this king of fierce countenance is, is pointing to Satan. And it's, we, we, we note here that it's not by his own power, I think there's another verse too. I can't remember where that is. I'm just thinking of it now, where um, that God is the one that is giving Satan this authority, like uh, in Esther three, when uh, King Ahasuerus gives Haman that authority. That was pointing to Satan's rule in the Great Tribulation. Um, mm -hmm. But we just note that. And then what Mr. Camping writes on page 363 is Nathaniel saw that the final destruction of the believers by a king of fierce countenance was typified by the final destruction of Israel by the Babylonians. So he ties these two passages together uh, through that fierce countenance. And I thought that was interesting. Um, the 11 days journey, that's in Deuteronomy 1 verse 2 that um, Robert made mention of, page 369. Um, interesting, I always find that interesting, that section. Um, the way that's laid out. I, I remember too, Chris had looked at this from another point of view uh, a few years ago. Um, so the teaching in 1994 is uh, the verse Deuteronomy 1 verse 2, there are 11 days journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir unto Kadesh Barnea. Um, Horeb is another name for Mount Sinai pointing to the law of God. Um, and how the law was initially given at the Garden of Eden. Um, uh, the way of Mount Seir, that was going to the world by way of the world. And then Kadesh Barnea is where the Israelites would enter the promised land of Canaan, and how spiritually the elect believers would enter into the promised land through Christ. So the teaching was in this book, 11 days or 11,000 years. So 11,000 years from the law given or from the Garden of Eden to the coming of Christ, you know, is 11,000 years from 11,013 BC to 7 BC. And uh, a few years ago, Chris looked at this in a study called The Smitten Rocks in the Wilderness. Um, and at the very end, he talked about um, could it be that maybe Horeb is pointing to where the rock, um, where the rock was cemented in the wilderness the first time, which we read about in Exodus 17, verse 6, and then Kadesh as where the rock was smitten the second time, where in Numbers chapter 20. And could it be that from 11,000 years or from Christ being smitten at the foundation of the world? which would be Horeb, and then Christ smitten in 33 AD, which would be Kadesh, 11 days journey or 11,000 years. Um, Chris sort of mentioned it as a possible, not as a, not as a means of replacing the understanding that Mr. Camping had here, but just as a 
another way of understanding it. Um, that study was just, it's September 16th, 2018. You could find that on ebiblefellowship.org under the audio Sunday studies. Um, it's at the very end. It's at the last, few, maybe last few minutes or so. Um, and then Eddie and Bob touched on the, the key points about the calendar. I was going to mention that as well, but uh, there's no need to. Um, and I think the one last question that I had about this was on, um, see if I can find this real quick, maybe not. That idea where he was taking, okay, it's on page 365. If you look at this uh, in the middle of the page, number two, creation to the coming Messiah, 7 BC. And then it says 11,000 years plus 2,300 days. And then in parentheses, six years. And my question was, how are we counting out the 2,300 days um, if we don't know the date of creation? How exactly are we doing that? I, I, um, I just wasn't sure how that, how that was done. Well, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I, I guess I'll try to <laughs> find a couple of things to touch on. You guys really covered it well. Um, what I noticed was there's a strong emphasis throughout chapter 11 on the number 11. And I think that was just a coincidence. Mm -hmm. um, but the 11 days journey that uh, Bobby was just talking about, Robert um, spoke of, the, the reference there to the Messiah. And that was one of the main points um, that from creation to the year 7 BC was 11,000 plus 2,300 days. And Mr. Camping also spoke about the number 23. You get into 23 years of um, inclusively from 609 to 587 to show how 23 identifies with the fullness of a number and, and with tribulation. And he, he spoke of... Um, from creation to the flood, 6,023 years. From the flood to the cross, um, which I think that may have that may have went to 34 AD, but it was 5,023 years. So he, he kept noticing these thousands of years and then these other significant dates that kept popping up like 7 BC, 33 AD, 34 AD. And 34 AD came up more than twice the time than 33 AD. And he kind of left that as a possibility. He even discussed, well, does the fact that 34 AD has more time passed than 33 AD indicate the, the study is invalid? And then he, uh, you know, he, he kind of set it up like a cliffhanger and he pulled out that, no, there's no year zero. And, and so every date that, or every time path went to 34 AD can be corrected to 33, to fall uh, actually on 33 AD, because there's two, time, two types of timekeeping, actual years and calendar years that God uses in the Bible. And uh, that, that meant there was, um, I think, 12 or 13 time paths that went to the year 33 AD. And, and other time paths were kept going to the year 7 BC. Um, and uh, well, he, he also mentioned on the topic of the number 11 that Joshua and Joseph um, died at age 110, as the last couple of people pointed out. And, uh, and, and that's unusual that he mentioned it twice because he, he um, said that Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Moses, and Aaron all um, were given one um, notation, that is, you only find one time in the Bible 
where God says that Abraham was 180 when he died or Isaac was 175. But with Joshua and Joseph, it was twice each for those two and, and they died at 110 um, because they were both great types of Christ and pointing to the Messiah. Um, and what Eddie mentioned to begin with, you know, that breakdown of uh, 7 BC to 33 AD, seven years on the Old Testament side, 33 years on the New Testament side, and, and then showing it, showing that great example with <clears throat> King David, a great type of Christ. And, and Eddie pointed out, you know, seven years he reigned in Hebron, 30, and then it would have been 33 years in Jerusalem. Uh, and not only does it fit there, but also the year David began to reign was a Jubilee year, just like 7 BC was a Jubilee year. And after 33 years reigning in Jerusalem, he died. And then the foundation of the temple was laid. And that points to, um, you know, Christ dying on the cross and, and demonstrating the laying of the foundation for the spiritual house of God. So that, that's really amazing. And it does show that God um, worked through and, and allowed that error in the calendar uh, for, for the Lord to be born 7 BC, and yet the calendar says, you know, that, or, or indicates that he was born in the year zero, and there's not even a year zero. Um, and, and we can, uh, we can see how, how God used that. And he pointed out how all the world basically operates according to that calendar. And God's the one who you know, designed it and, and allowed for this error. And all the world, all the world basically follows that error. They, they continue to follow that error. He also mentioned um, the birth of a, a baby boy, an Israelite boy um, that would be unclean for 40 days. And that's broken up seven days and 33 days. So that was something else he brought up. And on the eighth day, which would be the beginning of the 33-day period, he circumcised, and that ties in uh, with, with um, you know, the Lord Jesus. He made reference to the ark, captured and uh, restored. The ark was captured 1068 B.C., restored 1067 B.C., and each of those dates go to 33 and 34 AD and it's like 1100 years. Um, and, and, and then when you modify it and 34 AD actually falls on 33, both dates go to 33 AD and, um, and, and point to, to Christ. Um, one other thing that, that was interesting was there's one section it's um, towards the end where Mr. Camping lists, uh, it gives a quick list of numbers and their spiritual meaning. It's on page 378. And he goes from number two all the way down to 40. And we have pretty much every number that we talk about today, except I don't see the number 37 here. And uh, he includes 21. Um, which today, uh, he even, even including, and he says three times seven. So there's, there's no reason to have that number in here because it can be broken down to other numbers. There's no but, 17 either. Uh, I'm sorry? There's no 17 either. Oh, oh yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. huh. That's surprising. Um, but I, I just want to mention that pretty much we follow all or we we continue to have all the spiritual meanings except for the number two which he says uh represents the church and then later mr camping uh modified it to the caretakers of the word of god um and i think that's more accurate because here 
you know, um, we're living in a time when there is no church. And, and yet, sometimes the number two comes up in a study with the people of God, and, and it can't be the church mm -hmm. unless it's the eternal church. But that in number five, um, he refers to the spiritual meaning as grace and judgment. And he modified that also to atonement. And <clears throat> atonement basically means grace and judgment. So, um, you know, uh, I, I think, I think it, it's still um, pretty much the same thing. And then number 11, I always thought as number of the number 11 is um, pointing to the first coming of Christ but he has it as the certainty of salvation coming. And I think, I think that's a better definition because sometimes the number 11 appears um, in breakdowns like for the church age uh, and some other things after the cross, after the Lord has come already. But over the course of the church age for the first fruits, it's the certainty of salvation coming for the first fruit so i i i uh, think uh, i'm going to try and remember that you know as we go forward i think that's a better explanation you know chris on that same thing um you know, mr camping also used to talk about the number 11 pointing to uh defective fullness um, and he used a few examples of this. I, it was in Time Has an End, he noted that. And he used a few examples of, of where that came into be, like when Judas Iscariot died, there was only 11 apostles at that moment, and how that was like a defective fullness. And um, he used a few other examples, so we'd have to pull it up. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think about that? Well, uh, I, I think in that example, there was 12. So you had fullness, and then you take away one, and it went to 11. So I can see why he would say that. Um, I, I, I guess like with many things, you know, you have to look at the context of where the number is found or what, what's the context, the spiritual situation of a time path, what's in view. Um, because some of these, there, there is grace and judgment, um, like, like two sides of a coin. Perhaps there's an element of that because, yeah, how can one, once Judas falls and there's 11 apostles, um, the certainty of salvation coming doesn't, doesn't seem to fit that kind of scenario. Probably 17 is not in there because it really comes into view, uh, particularly from 1994 to 2011, and he didn't think there was going to be anything after 1994. So, um, I'm just... Well, we, we, might, we might find it later in the book. Um, doesn't he get into, I think there is a time pass, 3,400 years or something like that. Um, like in a later chapter yeah um, I, I think yeah the 1955 years too the the five times 17 times 23 um i, I think we're going to see it yeah i don't know why it's not included on the list but yeah i i wouldn't be surprised if it comes up a little later i have a question hey, Alex. oh god robert I have a question on page uh, 368, where Brother Camping uh, lists uh, the Jubilee year 7 BC five times. I don't understand why he lists that there. What, why the five times for the Jubilee in the year 3383 times? I, don't, I just don't understand that. You have 3485 times. Right above that, it says, Nathaniel now summarized the data he had gathered thus far. He, and he discovered that he arrived uh, at, and so that this is how many times that. <clears throat> yeah, that's from the last chapter. Seven BC was arrived at in the time pass. Oh. I was going to mention, uh, oh, God, Robert. 
and then over on the same page there at the middle, when he says, when he added this, the summary to his previous summary of dates, he saw the following, 7 BC, a Jubilee year, nine times. And it, it goes down the list. I was just, that just threw me off right there. These, these, yeah. these dates, I'm not, <laughs> give me a hard time. Yeah, he, he's taking the five from chapter 10, and then he added four more in this chapter to give that total. Oh. I had a question. Um, I'm not sure if anybody else noticed, but on page 364, uh, in the middle of the paragraph, he uh, talks about Nathaniel. Uh, he says, Nathaniel also knew from his previous study of the chronology of the beginning of the world, uh, chapter one, that these were literal 24 days. Uh, did he mean to say 24 hour days? Oh, uh, where, where is that at? Page three. My book, my book says literal 24 hour days. Therefore he knew too, that he must understand that the 2380 mornings of Daniel eight to be literal days. Okay, so I got. I must have an older version because yeah, mine, I mine have literal had, twenty-four hour days. <laughs> mine only says uh, literal twenty-four days. Uh, that's why I, I said, "Where did he get twenty-four days from?" Yeah. So there must have been a correction at some point. Um, I was going to point out on page three seventy-nine. Um, after you know, after going through all this and before summarizing everything, Mister Camping. Uh, refers to Galatians 4 to back up his conclusion that, that Christ was born in 7 BC and died in 33 AD, where it says in, in Galatians 4 verses 4 and 5, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. And Although, you know, it's true, Christ had to come when he did, and he had to go to the cross when he did. But I think this verse, we've learned, you know, recently that uh, these verses are really pointing to the time in every elect person's life when God saved them, uh, each individual elect person, and, and gave them eternal life. Um, it could have been when... An elect was in his or her mother's womb, like John the Baptist, or it could have been on uh, an elect person's deathbed or at any, any time in between. And, and it's all up to God's perfect timing for that individual. Yeah, I, I think Mr. Camping thought that, um, you, you know, leading up to May 21, 2011. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, I, don't, I don't know where maybe it's in time has an end or I don't know where he, it might be on an open forum, but uh, I'm pretty sure he taught that. Um, well, also, uh, I, yeah, I go, ahead, that, huh? go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, Bobby and Robert spoke about, um, uh, on, on page 363, when uh, uh, regarding the nation of fierce countenance, referring to Babylon, and uh, the king of fierce countenance, referring to uh, Satan. And uh, you guys already went over that, but I just wanted to uh, point out that, you know, in this book, 1994, and, you know, of course it was corrected later, but. Mr. Camping would eventually conclude that these 2,300 days, uh, uh, 2,400 evening, 2,300 evening mornings would begin on May 21, 1988 and end on September 7, 1994 with the end of the world. And then, you know, after 1994 passed, God opened up the scriptures uh, so that we could know that the tribulation on the nation of Israel was not just 23 years as he, as he had thought going from 609 BC to 587 BC, but that it was the whole 70 years from 609 until 539 when, when Cyrus 
uh, the king of Persia permitted the Israelite captives to go back and, and rebuild Jerusalem. And also we learned that um, the great tribulation uh, on the churches uh, would not be just 2,300 days, but it would be a full 23 years or 8,400 days going from May 21, 1988 to May 21, 2011. Um, and yeah, so that I just, you know, we all know that, but I just figured I'd point it out. Chris, um, that idea about in Deuteronomy 1 verse 2 about, um, you know, the 11 days journey, you had, as I mentioned, you kind of laid it out with that idea, but you didn't say it, you didn't really want to say it was like an absolute teaching. You were just, I don't know, uh, have you looked at that at all since or thought about that? At uh, no, I haven't. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> uh, I didn't even remember it until you just said it. Um, so I made a note. I want to try and listen to it. Okay. Um, what do you think about the uh, idea that um, on, on you know page three seventy two, um, Mister Camping referred to Matthew two, which speaks about Herod's attempt to kill Jesus. Uh, you know, after he was told by the wise men that, uh, that, 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 you know, this, this new king was born in Bethlehem. And uh, as a result, Herod had everybody killed, all the babies uh, two years and older, or two years old and under killed. Um, and of course, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph escaped to Egypt. Uh, but Mr. Camping pointed out that secular evidence showed that Herod died in 4 BC. Uh, so this was just another piece of evidence that um, that Jesus must have been born at least two years before 4 BC and that the Jubilee year of 7 BC, you know, fit perfectly. Um, I know that we don't, we don't like to trust secular data, but what do you think about that? Well, it, it uh, fits in as long as the secular data supports the biblical information, we can, we can say, well, it's likely correct. Um, and and it, it does show that, uh, that Herod could not have been alive in the year zero or the year one, um, you know, to these things could not have happened then because he had already been dead for a few years. And uh, so I think it's a good proof to show that, uh, that Christ had to be born before the calendar that we use says he was born. And then everything points to 7 BC. Yeah, 7 BC doesn't hang on this. It's just another, yeah. Yeah, yeah I actually looked that up online uh, just to see if other people uh, noticed that and, and uh, there, there are some people that have uh, kind of chimed in on the same thing that uh, Christ couldn't have been born on uh, they're saying 1 AD um, but because of the death of Herod and I didn't really look for or find you know uh, where the actual uh, record of his death is, uh, is recorded at but uh, uh, I thought that was pretty interesting too I had to highlight it here Well, I, I think it's good to use because, uh, you know, we go by the biblical evidence and the biblical evidence, you know, all those, what was it, nine times to 7 BC, yeah. and it's a jubilee year, and Christ is the essence of the jubilee, but to say to, um, 
people in the churches because it would mainly be those in the churches that would try and dispute and and say no that can't be right to say to them well yeah but there's secular evidence archaeological evidence that herod died in 4 bc and then when you figure mm -hmm. he calculated um killing the children according to the time given by the wise men two years and under that that does show at least 6 bc and i think when whenever you um refer to archaeological or secular evidence that those in the churches are more receptive <laughs> exactly yeah they, they don't fight against that they're oh, oh yeah okay that's amazing. Um, where all this other stuff that comes from the bible these time pass and can be proven by a biblical calendar yeah they'll they'll fight against that uh constantly but but a secular reference it it serves a purpose that i think you had touched about you had talked about a young earth uh you know they that a lot of people that hold to this uh under seven thousand year earth right where you know just just secular evidence evidence alone uh disproves that well yeah that that is odd uh because they they don't seem to uh take into account that secular evidence yeah in in that case i don't know why because they they definitely uphold um archaeology and their findings um like with the example mr camping always gives concerning the fall of samaria um mm -hmm. you know what, what are they they insist it was like 721 and uh, actually it was years before and, and the bible proves the date and they reject the the biblical info and go wow. with the archaeologists And on page 372, Mr. Camping right a very, uh, where he writes there, shows that the Bible is its own dictionary, his own interpreter. At the top of page 372, for, furthermore, he knew, speak about Nathaniel, that in his search, he had been faithful to the scriptures. He had not introduced any secular evidence. He had faithfully allowed the Bible to be his own interpreter and uh how true true that statement is that the bible is god's word it is his own interpreter and we don't have we don't need any outside writings when we come to god's word of the bible we search the scriptures and by god's mercy we be so true that we'll open our understanding to the truth of god's word yeah i think that's true i mean a lot of people they they'll read something in the bible um or hear something biblical but they'll turn to the secular evidence to see if the secular evidence agrees and like i said if it doesn't agree well then whatever you're understanding from the bible must be incorrect that's backwards in other words I don't think anybody mentioned this on, on page 358. Uh, Nathaniel was looking at um, how the number 12 played a role in, in the uh, coming, the timing of the coming of the Messiah. Uh, he knew, he saw that Jacob had 12 sons, which became the 12 tribes of Israel, but, but Joseph was given a double inheritance. And so his two sons uh, became two tribes the two tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh. So this actually made 13 tribes, but when God lists the tribes in the Bible, one tribe is typically left out to arrive at the number 12. Um, and they're pointing to the fullness uh, of the kingdom of God. And, and he, he also saw that there were other examples of the number 12 uh, in the Old Testament, uh, such as 120 years that God gave Noah to build the ark before he would destroy the earth by a flood. Um, uh, 24 
courses of priests, 24 courses of singers listed in First Chronicles, which would be uh, 12 times 2, and 1,440 years going from the Exodus and Passover in 1447 BC to the Jubilee year in 7 BC, which would be 12 times 12 times 10. And lastly, the 1200 years from when Gideon died to the Jubilee year in 7 BC, which would be 12 times 10 times 10. So you have all these 12s there, which uh, started to, uh, in Nathaniel, uh, Nathaniel's eyes, with, with pointing to uh, uh, a significant uh, timing in, in the coming of the Messiah. That's all I got. <laughs> all right. I think that's all all of us got. <laughs> so well, I guess we'll go ahead and close with the word of prayer and maybe just open up the floor for questions a little early. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks once again, Lord. Uh, Lord, that you allow us to uh, uh, go over Mr. Camping's books and uh, and talk about it, Lord, because they're all focused on your work, Father. And, and we're thankful, Lord, that you can uh, uh, shed some light on this uh, and, and allow us to see, Lord, uh, what you would have us to see. We ask, Lord, that you continue to be with us, Lord. Help us, Lord, as we continually grow and continually uh, look for truth, uh, look for understanding, Lord. And, Lord, we ask that you help us to obtain it. And we thank you, Father, for the remainder of this evening, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So uh, I guess we're going to go ahead and open up the floor for questions. Carl, if there's anybody that has a, a question. Uh, so far, I don't see any questions. So. But I did want to mention, uh, we do have the toll-free numbers. So if anyone wants to call in via phone, you can either find that information on Chris's Facebook wall, or um, I posted it in the chat as well. Is there a way to keep track of? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, how, how's that work, Carl? Is it just a, a 800 number and people call, or what do they have to do? Okay, so um, there's gonna be a list of phone numbers. There's about, uh, there's just one number they have to call that's from the US. And after they call that number, they have to, um, I could just give you the steps. So the first thing is to dial the number. In this case, it's 833-548-0276. Then they have to dial in the meeting ID and that will take them to this particular Zoom meeting. Um, the third step is they have to press pound. And lastly, they have to type in a passcode. Uh, once they do that, they'll be in the meeting. And then they have to press star six to unmute themselves. And star nine is to raise their hand. Um, and these steps are all laid out? For They're people? all laid out. Yep. They're going to be posted on the website. And then I have a list of all <laughs> the international numbers. There's about, uh, well, there's a few hundred it looks like so there's a lot of numbers so each each country has their own number i see a question from uh yep. seven yep is that gary seven so i guess we'll find out hello seven You have to accept the link so you can. Yeah, they're unmuted. Like, what's that? The person, the person is unmuted. If you have a question, like and, yeah, if you can hear us and you have a question, you can go and ask your question. Could be their mic's not working. Can you tell if that's someone who just called up or, or if that person has been here? Um, or what kind of, I guess, in the video chat or that would be audio? Can yeah, you, this, is, can you tell? this is, they're in the video chat, yeah. 
you can tell if they're on a cell phone because it'll have a cell phone icon right next to them. Um, I don't think this person's microphone's working because next to the microphone, you'll see an audio wave. And I don't see that. Let's try it again. Hello. Hello, can you hear us? Yeah, it doesn't, it looks like this person's having microphone issues. Sometimes it feels like the more advanced we get, the more behind we fall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, One just day it's all anything. going to come together <laughs> <laughs> for 24 hours, and then it'll fall yeah. apart again. <laughs> um, I do, uh, I do want to point out, or I should mention that if um, if you know of somebody outside the U.S., then please feel free to share these numbers that I that I'm going to post on the website. That way, you can. We can encourage other people from different countries to call in. Okay. Well, let's go on to chapter 12, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> what is chapter, chapter 12, Daniel 9 again, right? I'd like to see this be ready by next week. <laughs> well, we have two weeks, so there won't be a panel discussion next week. Uh, yeah. Next week is the weekend day in the Word. So the next schedule, Lord willing, will be Sunday, June 12th, um, when we would plan to look at uh, Chapter 12, the 70 Weeks of Daniel 9. This was also another booklet that Mr. Campbell published many years ago. Uh, around 1979, I believe it was first published. And he then inserted it into this book. Oh, okay. He's also given studies on this, which I can't find. I've been trying to find them. I think they were from 1992 at the uh, one of the, the Florida conferences. He had done three studies on this and I just can't seem to find them. Was it Lake Yale conference? Yes. Okay. I did find um, some studies in Isaiah he did that were recorded there okay at the lake heel bible conference okay that's not what you're looking for though right no yeah it was i think they were titled 70 weeks of daniel 9 it was like around 1992 or so they aired on the bible class of the mm -hmm. air i think it was a lot of the same material that's in this chapter I have a lot of those studies. I'll, I'll look through that. Ed, do you want to mention uh, the the food? <clears throat> yeah. Um, so the the weekend in the Word is uh, uh, next Saturday and Sunday. And if anybody's going to be uh, wanting to bring some food, uh, it would actually help me because uh, I'm kind of coordinating that part. Uh, if you guys would let me know, um, I guess you could send an email to ebiblefellowship at juno.com and they can forward that to me. Um, if you guys plan on bringing anything, um, because, you know, I, I want to make sure we, we have plenty of food. Um, but what I don't, I don't, when I don't know what anybody else is bringing, um, I, I sometimes try to plan to have enough, but then I don't want to have so much in, in abundance that it ends up going to waste if nobody wants to take it home. Uh, so, you know, it, it'd be nice to have, of course, plenty, but not more than what we need. Um, so I do have a couple of people that have already contacted me. They told me what they uh, what they want to bring. And uh, so I'm just kind of keeping a list is all. And that kind of helps me narrow the, down what I need uh, to bring as well. Did guy make it into the group yet? 
Yeah, yeah I'm here. Still... Okay, yeah. When you guys were talking about Mr. Camping studies, I, I just pulled up. Uh, I have quite a few of his audio studies. Somebody gave me. Um, um, let me see. I have about it's almost almost nineteen gigabytes worth of his study, um, or worth of his studies uh, from Bible Class of the Air, Timeline of History Part One and Two, Echoes, End Time Study, Lord's Day Studies. Uh, studies by specific books, uh, and then to God be the glory. Uh, these are all just audio studies. Did guy, guy? Did you want? Did you want to start the Bible reading early? Sure. Yeah, sure. <laughs> 